try. <laughs> Dave was coaching me and turning the mic on. It was a fine art. Right. How are you folks this morning? Bless. It's good to be with you, my wife, Betsy, so long. I was driving uh, this way. We live in Shoreview, Minnesota, about a little bit less than an hour away, and we were coming over. I said, you know, I remember it's probably been 40 years that Jim McCracken and I visited this church when it was still meeting in the community center. And uh, yes, yeah, so it goes back a ways. Yeah. And as we were worshiping, I, I just want to share this with you. I kept getting this picture. And so I want to offer it to you as a congregation. It was a picture of a wonderful layer cake. How many of you like cake? Oh. Who doesn't like cake, right? And so I said, Lord, what are you showing me? And there's all these different layers, and they, they look unique, but they were all stacked up making a cake. And then I, I watched the cake get cut, and I heard the Lord say to me, tell them to keep serving cake. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here's what I think the Lord is saying in that, is that each of you bring an element of Christ, and it, it, together it forges this wonderful cake and everyone does like cake, right? Who doesn't like cake? There's something very sweet here that God wants you to continue to serve. And as people come, just to extend that sweetness that Jesus has very much vested here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Lord, do it. All right, here, let's see. Here we go. Let's turn this on. Here it's been helping me out on the slide. Plant the things. I have also been uh, meeting fairly regularly with your pastor, Pastor David, as he's on sabbatical. I, I, there's so many things the Lord leads you into that you have no idea you know, you're going to wind up going there. Um, and probably a year before COVID hit that whole thing, uh, God started sending me tired pastors. And uh, many of them were granted a respite, a sabbatical, after COVID. So at this point in time, I've coached 83 pastors through sabbaticals. And in 42 years of ministry, I've never seen this level of fatigue. I mean, I think you guys see it. You see it in our, our culture, in our country. It, 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 things polarize. They're reactive. Um, very difficult to be a leader in any realm. Uh, so it's been my privilege to walk with pastors along the way, and I'm very grateful for that call. We're going to be in Matthew 11, so if you have your Bibles, you can open them. I'm also going to put them on the PowerPoint slides. And as I pray for you and the church, and Lord, what do you want to say? I, I, I was drawn to this account of John the Baptist in Matthew 11. And the big question he's asked is, are you the one? And you know, we get this book full of stories of a bunch of people, Right? From cover to cover, with all these animated stories, you know, from Moses to Jeremiah to Deborah, you, you name it. And some of them seem like they're superheroes of a sort. Like Elijah is like one of my favorite uh, Old Testament characters. And Paul, or, or the, the guy that we'll talk about today, John the Baptist, seems like a bit of a superhero. But it turns out that. They, too, put on their pants the same way we do, one leg at a time. And so there, there's things that they experience that we experience. There's things that they walk through that we get to read about and learn from. And let's face it, that those of us that have been walking with the Lord for uh, a short while, we know there's lots of challenges. Is there not? There's twists and turns. I didn't see that coming. All these different things, and we think that there's going to be one thing the Lord is going to do, and, and then it's another. And we, we have an idea that maybe this will unfold, and then that's not what unfolds. There's something else that rolls out. And when I was teaching a, a class some, some years ago, we were talking about if you had to give the Bible kind of a, a snapshot title, what would you do? And we were going around the class, and it was really clear to me that this would be the title that I would kind of subtitle the Bible, is, wow, I didn't see that coming. Right? If you think about all these stories of all these people, wow, I didn't see that coming. 
I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see Moses, the murderer, being called out of the field to go back to Egypt. And then when he went back to Egypt, under the direction of the Lord, I didn't, I didn't see or think that Israel was going to, in a day, turn around and want to kill him. And then when he's leading him out, you think, well, this is a fine mess. Now we've got an army chasing us and a big sea in front of us. What does the Lord do? He splits the sea. You're like, wow. I didn't see that coming. And so John the Baptist would be like every other Israelite in his time, looking for the Messiah, hoping the Messiah is going to come, that the Messiah is going to right the wrongs that have been done to primarily Israel, kick Rome in the hind end and get them out of there, and he's going to set things right. And it's not exactly what's rolling out. John the Baptist says some idea that it's going to be this way and he's got, he's got notions of what it's going to be like and as we open the story in Matthew 11, this is what we read where John who was in prison wow I didn't see that coming this is John John the guy that was spirit filled in the womb who was called by God, who who ushered in the Messiah, who had the privilege of baptizing the Messiah, and whereupon doing it, here's the, the Father shout from heaven, this is my Son, with whom I'm well pleased. And he's in the slammer. I didn't see that coming. Did you see that coming? John didn't see that coming. And reality is hitting him hard. You see, for us, we, we only see in part. We only know in part. In my life, in your life, there's these twists and turns, and, and we, we can't know it all. We can't see it all. At this point in time, at the age of 66, I thought I would have hair. <laughs> wow! I didn't see that coming. It's gone. Because we, we only see in part. We only know in part. And John is only getting part of the picture. In fact, as it gets part of the picture, this is what Matthew 11, Jew into verse 3 says, that while he's in jail, he hears about the deeds of the Messiah. Now, on one hand, John would have been so thrilled, like, oh, this is, this is cool. He, he's, he's doing what he's saying. He's healing people, but I'm in the slam. I'm in jail. I didn't think I'd end up here. Especially because I've been a truth teller. Especially because I've, I've done my best to represent God in every way I can. To live for him. To live righteously. I'm, I'm in jail. And the reason that I'm in jail is, is wrong. Wicked King Herod is mad because I called him out on his marriage to his brother's sister. Just calling the kettle black. That's all I'm doing. And I'm in jail. And although he's hearing about these deeds out there, he's wondering, isn't the Messiah going to deal with this? Doesn't he deal with the unrighteous? Will he not drive Rome out? Is he going to let this go on? And he sits in a place where he's really confused about how this is rolling out. Have you ever been there? A turn in your story with Jesus where I didn't think I'd be here. I didn't think that this would go down this way, that it would work out quite like this. But don't fail to see the wisdom of the Baptist. Because look what he does. In response to, I didn't see this coming. In response to, I can't, I, I, didn't, I didn't recognize this. I, I didn't think it was going to be quite like this. This is what John does. He sends his disciples to ask Jesus. The great John the Baptist was bringing his questions and his doubts into the light. Go and ask the master. Go and ask the rabbi. We don't often talk about the battles that we have with doubt in church. 
And see, Christ never fails to distinguish between doubt and unbelief. Doubt, doubt is I'm struggling to believe. I want to believe, but I'm struggling. Unbelief is I won't believe. Doubt is, Lord, show me. I'm looking for light. I'm looking for an answer. Would you, would you make your way clear to me? And unbelief is like, I'm fine here. I don't need you. When we don't see it, we're wise to say, I can't see it. Help me see it. And even the mighty John the Baptist, one who has seen so many things, and can you imagine being the person who baptized Jesus and then hears the audible voice of God? That would kind of stay with you, wouldn't it? But he's struggling. So he asked the question, are you the one who is to come? Are you it? Or should we expect somebody else to come along? Are you the one? Are you the one? Betsy and I have spent years, when I was a college student, my senior year in college, I worked as a head resident, which means that you're in charge of the dorm. And then from there, uh, after the Lord saved me, I went to work at St. Olaf College in Northfield. And uh, while I was there, that's where I met my wife, Betsy. And um, actually, that's where I, I met the Lord, was at, at St. Olaf. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was an amazing place. You know, when I met the Lord, I'll just tell you this real quick story. Um, I was struggling. I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to shake addiction to drugs. And um, I was trying with all my might, and I was struggling. And all one of my student workers told me was, hey, if you want Jesus in your heart, all you have to do is ask him to invite him in your heart. And then he surprised me. He said, do you want to pray? And he caught me off guard. I was kind of a big, tough guy then. And he said, do you want to pray? And I was like, no, 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 no. But his head was already bowed. So I bowed my head. When I bowed my head, I began to see all the places in my life I should have died. Three times I should have drowned. My parents found me in the bottom of a pool. Motorcycle accidents, car accident where I was launched through the windshield, several times drug overdoses, and all these places. And I said to the Lord at the end, I said, Lord, if you want this wreck of a life, you can have it. When I opened my eyes, it was about an hour and a half later. I stayed up talking to the Lord all night, confessing my sin. I had a long, it took all night. And about two weeks later, nobody really talked to me about the fact that God's probably going to talk to you. And I was working on these work orders, and all of a sudden I hear, start a Bible study. It was so clear I went like this. And no one. I thought, that's weird. Went back to my work orders. Five minutes later, start a Bible study. I got out of my chair. Like, where are you? And I thought, this is kind of crazy. And I went back to my workforce, but I couldn't really focus. I heard it again. Start a Bible study. So I figured, well, the voice is talking to me. I'll talk to my voice. And this is telling. It'll let you know about how far off I was. I said to the voice, I don't know why you're asking me to start a Bible study. The only thing I know about the Bible is it's black. And some guy named King James wrote it. <laughs> and you think that would have shut the idea down right there. But the Lord persisted. I couldn't shake it. So I finally took a little, like, three by five note card and put it downstairs at the fire exit door saying, uh, Bible study, Hedner's apartment, Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Tuesday, 7 o'clock rolls around, 47 students show up. That's what I did. I mean, I was like, whoa. <laughs> And that was the, the introduction of my call. I started to realize what I, what I was called to do and be. I didn't have words for it. I never went to church. So I, I didn't know. I said to my friend, like, I think I'm supposed to work for God. He goes, do you mean like a pastor? And I said, do pastors work for God? <laughs> said, yes. But one of the other things that I noticed about being around college students is they get to be juniors or seniors in college. And they start looking at that, at all the potential mates, and they go, are you the one? 
Are you the one? Are you the one that I'm going to marry? I'm going to put rings on? And, and they get sappy. They get Twitter painted like in Bambi. They lose their sensibility. <laughs> and part of, part of what my work is, is I, I work as a, I've worked as a pastor for 42 years, and I've also worked as a marriage and family counselor for 42 years. So I sit with a lot of young people who are going to get married. And when they're Twitter painted, and when the hormones are in, you can't talk sense to them. Do you think you're going to have any struggles? Oh, no. <laughs> Not with this one. This is the one. You don't think you're going to ever have any conflicts? Oh, we never have conflicts. This is the one. <laughs> oh. You say, well, come and see me in a year. We have lots to talk about. You see, we got a certain idea of what the one's going to be like. Right? And, and, and then all of a sudden, you go, oh, it's not always working out the way I thought it would. It's a little bit different than what I thought. And Jesus is surrounded by this. They have all kinds of ideas and expectations about what he's going to be. And when he crosses them, people ask this question, are you the one? I thought you were going to do this. His disciples are wondering, he's going to do this. The Pharisees thought he would do that. The Sadducees thought he would do this. Are you the one? But look what Jesus does. He's used to fielding questions. and he, he says this. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't get angry with John submitted down. He doesn't say, hey, go back and tell John, hey, buddy, have you forgotten so quickly? He doesn't do that. There's no shame or blame happening. He says, go and remind him. Because he would have known what John the Baptist was calling, preparing the way of the Lord. And what he was calling for is righteous acts. He was calling for being, remembering the people who are outcast, downcast, the people who were rejected. He, he, he should, this is like speaking code to John. Oh, yes, yes. Jesus is saying, look, John, I'm bringing freedom to those who have been exiled. A freedom that no one can take away. John is telling him, or Jesus is telling John, look here, look, look here, John. You see, I'm seeking and saving the lost ones. Trust me. I'm righting the wrongs. Trust me. Look at me. Not at the circumstances. Not at what you thought would happen. Look at me. Because Jesus goes on to say there's an additional beatitude I'm going to insert here. An addendum to the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is anyone, anyone who does not stumble on account of me. The word stumble there in the Greek is, is a word scandalon. What does that sound like? Scandal. Have we not <coughs> seen tons of scandals in our lifetime? I thought, I thought they were going to do this. I thought they stood for that. I thought they said they were going to do this. I thought they promised that. Scandal, scandal, scandal. But Jesus is saying, blessed, happy, joyful, settled, peaceful is the one who does not buy into some idea that I'm scandalous. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is no scandal to be found. In other words, Jesus is exhorting John, don't lose the real me to the imagined me you see right now. Some contrived idea. There's no cover-ups. There's no scandal. There's no secret. Jesus is who he says he is. He says, look, look at me. Because the reality is that you will not find hope, the freedom that you crave, the life that you want, by somehow ordering the world around you in the way that you think it should be. Because it will crumble. 
If there's one thing that the world's history shows, you know, it gets put in one place and the next thing you know it's falling apart. Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way of peace that you're looking for, John. It's in me. As I'll tell my students later, abide in me. Because as the chapter uh, wraps up, there's something really important that Jesus says in Psalm. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. The rest you want can be experienced right in jail, John. <coughs> Your colleague Paul will write the letter of joy from jail. How? Because he's found a place to dwell in me. He's not really in jail. He's in Jesus. He's not really chained to the law. He's bound to me. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. Not circumstances, not this world, not your ideas of what should happen. Yes, come to me with your questions, your doubts. I'll give you rest. What's really interesting about this word rest is it's a compound Greek word. Could translate it. Get this. I will give you rest from you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Spencer has caused far more unrest for Mark Spencer than anybody else. <laughs> I have caused more problems for myself than anyone else could have even imagined. Mark Spencer's biggest challenge is Mark Spencer. <laughs> and this promise from the one who cannot lie. Listen, no matter where you are, come to me. And I promise, I will give you rest. And even deep rest from yourself. And that is the peace that overcomes the world. Is it not? Let's pray. Lord, I don't know where my friends are at. You do so grateful that your eyes upon each and every one of us, you know, you know our story, you know our journey, you know our way. And I pray, Lord, that if there's places where we're stuck, where it's like, I didn't think it would be this way, I didn't think I'd be here, or go through this, or suffer that, or lose this, Lord, in a fresh way, we, we step into your word and the light that it offers to us that the very peace that we crave, that the joy that we yearn for, that the security of heart that we hope for can only be found in you. And there is no scandal. What you say you'll do. So I pray even now, today, through the week, your spirit would be moving among us in such a way is to bring fresh light, to bring new awareness, to give us eyes to see what you're doing, and hearts to go after that. We pray this is